Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And joining me today is one of the hardest working historians I know. Dr. Helen Fry has graciously taken some time in her crazy busy schedule to talk about her new book, Women Intell Intelligence, which I have a copy of here that I got at the We Have Ways Fest. So I'm going to bring Helen in now. So good evening, Helen. How are you today? Great. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. Well, it's been a long time and we had internet troubles that, that, that last time. I don't know what was going on there, but the, the gremlins are, are, are free tonight. So we, we're good. So you're, you're a prolific author, intelligence, agents, spies, you know, all that kind of under the cover stuff, but also giving this incredible voice to, to, to women. And, you know, before we get into the subject, we brought a PowerPoint is and it's a trite question, but I'm going to get the trite, pathetic one out of the way at the beginning. But basically, why is it is it important to bring the voices of women who served in the two wars to the forefront? Well, as you know, I've already written quite widely on military intelligence. So if you'd asked me this question last time I was on the show, I would have said, no, I, I'm not going to be doing a book on the women because there are so many historians doing that already. But there's so many stories that started to emerge in my research that I realised if I don't tell these stories and shine a light on these particular women, no one else will. I just got a sense that they just wouldn't necessarily see them as important. And hence, we've got a whole book on some familiar stories, but an awful lot of new material. And when I was working on the military intelligence files, I found the stories really inspiring. And I thought, yeah, it's time. So the result, women in intelligence across Brilliant. two world wars. And we'll bring up the PowerPoint now and then you can guide me through. Just tell me when to do the next slides. And, and the other thing is that, and I and I confessed to Helen a minute ago, I haven't actually read the book yet. It came back with We Have Ways with a suitcase full of books. But in my thumbing through of it is, is that intelligence is a very broad term. I mean, it covers multitudes of ro roles from very, very active, proactive, going out and doing stuff in enemy territory to a, a very no less important but kind of back room behind the scenes work and 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 i think that that's what makes it so compelling is the is the range of of, of tasks within what sounds like a, intelligence sounds like a simple mm. um concept but as you as you will talk about it's it covers many many aspects so let's so let's start at the beginning and we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about the the origins in the first world war and i'll let you guide me through and folks if you have questions, far away with questions. David O'Keefe is in the audience, it looks like today, so we might get something about Canada. But I'm going to hand over to Helen. Can I just give us a bit of introduction to, to women in intelligence? Yeah, you're right about that, Paul, that it's uniformed civilian organisations. It's right across the board, air intelligence, naval intelligence, military intelligence, and, of course, operations behind enemy lines. And with that in mind, in the First World War, there were some hugely significant networks behind enemy lines. Yesterday was the anniversary of the execution of Edith Cavell, British nurse. This huge monument, I mean, it's several people high, absolutely huge. I'm not quite sure how high it is, something like 20 foot high. Huge memorial to Edith in the centre of London, just near Trafalgar Square, outside the National Portrait Gallery. And I've walked past it so many times. But then writing the women's book, I suddenly thought, who is this? And I looked up and Edith Cavell. And I already knew that I would have to answer the question of whether or not she was a spy. And so she actually, from 1914 until her execution, she was shot at dawn as I said, on the 12th of October, 1915. Until then, she actually founded and was established, recruited agents in intelligence gathering for the British. So that for me was a really important moment when I found concrete evidence that she wasn't just rescuing French and British soldiers, she was actually running an intelligence network that she herself had formed with a Belgian architect. And the Belgians were very, very important during the First World War in providing intelligence, particularly on the movement of German troops across occupied Belgium. Because as our folks know, because they're all experts on mm. your show, if the Germans needed to move their troops to the front line, they had to go through Belgium or occupied Luxembourg. Yeah. And so the train watching network, we mustn't underestimate, 
became hugely significant in providing vital intelligence and using quite traditional early spy craft. And Edith Cavell was right at the heart of it. So she's sort of the founding figure in, in a sense of, of British intelligence from, from, the, from the female kind of perspective, so to speak. And uh, is that how you would kind of classify it? She certainly is one of the early women, as far as we can tell, in intelligence in occupied countries in the First World War. But there were female spies and male spies operating in the 17th century. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth I, of course, before the period of the Civil War, uh, succeeded to the throne in England. And she was, if you like, a spy mistress. And there's a very mm. famous painting of her in Hatfield House, which is in north of London in, in a stately home. And she's got those eyes and ears on her dress. And she very much is seen as, as founding an intelligence organisation, but not very formalised. It was a kind of loose organisation under Walsingham, Francis Walsingham. But yes, some of the techniques that they used then, we'll see carrying through into the early part of the 20th century. So the likes of Edith Cavell are certainly not the first. Intelligence, the second oldest profession. Mm. Um, <laughs> we know what the first is. Uh, so, yeah. Well, brilliant She's stuff. And we'll, we'll move kind of through your slides. And another thing, a question I, I was going to ask you later, but it's come into my head right now, is when you're sifting through the different women in, in history and in your, in your previous books, is there is there um, a, a character trait that you think defines or, or or unifies these types of people? Is there a is it is it an is it in, is it intelligence themselves, uh, or is it a a, a and an anonymity to kind of go through go through life without being seen. What is there one thing, or is there two two multi ranging uh, skill sets to kind of label it on, put it on one thing? I think it's multi faceted. Actually, if we look at the female agents behind enemy lines, and I don't want to divorce them from their male backdrop, but if we look at those women, they are strong. There is a, a sense that they need to recover if they're in occupied territory, their democracy, they need to work with the allies towards liberation. And they see themselves as having a vital role in providing intelligence. They never saw themselves as being particularly heroic. They did what they believed they had to do. And that was the same again in the Second World War, mm. in the same occupied countries. They knew that the intelligence that they could provide to the British and in the cases to French intelligence would actually make a difference because it was very difficult to find out behind enemy lines what was going on. You'll, you'll know that the Germans constructed this hugely high voltage electrified fence in May 1915 along the Belgian border and also with neutral Holland to stop the flow of Belgians coming, certainly leaving Belgium, but also to stop spies coming in and out. And it becomes really difficult to see what is happening in those countries. What are the Germans doing in terms of moving their troops and where are those troops heading for? So they, the women knew that they were important. And the other important thread is that they were invisible. Because yeah. the Germans didn't really, on the whole, suspect them of espionage. I mean, going back to Edith Cavell very briefly, she was betrayed by someone, Kien, under intense interrogation. So he'd been captured and was interrogated. So one could understand that he hadn't been able to hold out. But by and large, the Germans didn't think women were engaged in espionage. And therefore, they were moving around enemy territory, largely invisible. Wow. And, and, and that... That remind reminding us there that in the First World War, there weren't the multiple ways of getting intelligence that perhaps we had in the Second World War with aerial photos and 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 ultra and yes. code breaking and all that. It is you know old fashioned, almost like we think for for from spy movies. You know, people with kind of turned up collars standing on you know listening to conversations. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm making a bit of a trite, but it is that sort of old fashioned, just eyes and ears on the ground picking up information. Partly, but there are yep. also very simple codes, and some of the coded messages are sent back in newspaper reports. 
and others are knitted into jumpers or Brilliant. scarves. So the women are wonderful in that they're from the age of sort of 18 all the way into their 80s. Those women that could knit were innocently sat outside their cottages in the summertime or in the windows in the winter. They are actually watching the train networks going past their window, but they're busy knitting. And of course, if the German soldiers are to see them knitting or any of the patrols, they'll just think, little old lady, you know, she's mm. doing her knitting but she's actually coding what she's seen. And that jumper or scarf would be chucked over the wire or somehow sent. And again, the Germans just think, well, okay, they're just sending a jumper out, but it's actually got a code in. And I, I love to think of the poor, probably male intelligence officer at headquarters, at military headquarters. They were stationed in France, decoding. <laughs> and of course they use pigeons, pigeons mm. and messages. There was a high price prize for german soldiers if they could shoot down a pigeon that was carrying a message they got up to three weeks of leave if i'm not mistaken wow so yeah it was really significant so pigeons were used in the first world war and of course again in the second world war oh, yeah. so those were the early ways of primarily communicating mm. and who are we looking at in these photos before we move on the group photograph are women of MI5 in 1918. Obviously, it's just a, a selection, a, a section of MI5. But there's a really important work in the First World War being done by women in intelligence organisations like MI5 and Special Branch. They're working on intelligence. And what I discovered is that they start to become experts in their field. So they're not just typists and secretaries, they're actually developing an expertise that's actually needed. And some of them really begin to rise up and, and people can read about that in my book, The Progress That's Made. And mm. the women are very good at long-term concentration, painstaking jobs. And the women of MI5 actually begin to rise like Jane Sismore Archer, she becomes Mrs. Archer, pictured on the right of our screen there, you can see she doesn't look as though she works for MI5. Well, actually she does. She works full time for MI5. And in her spare time, this is in the 1920s, she actually trains to be a barrister, which in itself is really unusual, but she has an awesome mind and she becomes a foremost and formidable interrogator and she interrogates the first soviet defector walter kravitsky and becomes an expert on soviet intelligence wow and it's a good time to ask a question from rob crane is in the audience who's saying were the first world war spies mostly from higher social levels because that photo at the top there strikes me that that they are not from the not from the bottom uh, of society well, certainly from MI5, yes, trusted networks, trusted families, recruitment through certain ladies' colleges. So, yes, in on, on the home front, behind enemy lines, a variety of women. We have photographs, really moving photographs of women who look quite poor, actually. They look as though they're sort of bordering on poverty outside these tiny, tiny cottages, almost like one up, one down. Um, but also behind enemy lines, we have the other end of the spectrum where we have counts, countesses actually using their castles as headquarters where they run local intelligence organisation and also where they shelter our soldiers. Mm -hmm. So it's it's mixed. We cannot say... Certainly behind enemy lines, it was anyone who felt that they could help and wanted to help yeah, towards and, the liberation of their country. And another good question, which apply, will apply to your research generally in, in, in various books, is, um, and Jeff Braden is saying, uh, the Official Secrets Act that dictate how long information can be re released with intelligence, when would it be earliest be that these women's stories be available to the public? So <laughs> is, it, is, it, is, the, is it a standard set of uh, number of years or is it complicated depending on the, the, the secrecy levels? It's much more complicated. So if I say just very briefly that the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, never releases its files not ever. Occasionally you get copies of letters and memos in the war office files or foreign office files. And, and if those files from the war office, foreign office, 
naval intelligence have been released and finally you know you do sometimes get an insight so mi6 never mi5 sometimes releases files and it seems to be to us historians quite random <laughs> and it's not a set time it's not oh it's 50 years we'll we'll release all of these files i wouldn't like to even guess the percentage of mi5 files in the national archives in london whether it's 10 percent five percent it certainly isn't the whole range of mi5 files for a particular era wow so we're just lucky with what we've got we know quite a lot about the women of mi5 in the 1920s because mi5 commissioned a report internally and it was published internally in 1929 and that's really extensive and there are other similar documents which tell us about women and their relationship with the men in trying to get equal pay and that kind of thing mm. so that was released but quite late there is no rule that this can come out after 100 years or 75 so we're just lucky with what is released and it's the same with war office naval mm. intelligence files exactly the same there's no automatic release in the same way as there would be for like cabinet files wow. that quite often come out just after 30 years. So now we're starting to see files, not that I've worked on, but for Margaret Thatcher's government mm. and even, even later. But that's not true for the intelligence material. So we work with what we've got. Mm. But that must be exciting for someone like yourself and also the next generation of Helen Fry's and Claire Mullies who, are, who, are, who maybe will discover stuff that you couldn't even possibly imagine existed because a flurry of documents will come out about another incredible set of individuals and, and, yes. and the people will go, wow, there's another book there. Whereas in my field, D-Day and the Battle of Normandy, there's not really likely to be anything earth shattering that comes out that changes. You never know. but Oh, yeah. there could be. Like, I mean, you have to hope there's always, there always could be. But, you know, with, with the with the MI5 spying, yeah. into, there, there could be that best-selling books that no one knows is going to be written yet. There's, there's a file that'll come out and someone will be there on a research day at the National Archives and go, my God, there's a book here. But that's a rabbit hole that we don't want to get down. So we've we've covered the kind of the First World War origins. And, and now with the next slide, I mean, certainly on the left there, we're, we're talking, we're getting into kind of legendary status with some of these people we we're are. talking about next. So, so over to you to, to explain who we're looking at. Yes, so on the left, we've got Vera Atkins. This is a photograph I took from her actual SOE file. SOE being the Special Operations Executive for anyone who's new to the programme and is not sure. On the right-hand side is Margot Morse, and I'll talk about her in a moment. But why I've got these women here is because, well, particularly in the case of Vera Atkins, we know that she goes up to pretty much run a lot of the agents, men and women, of F section. She becomes deputy head of F section under Buckmaster, Morris Buckmaster. And she's training, well, recruiting, training, and dispatching agents behind enemy lines. And before the first uh, end of the Second World War, she's already beginning to think about the fate of the agents that don't come back. So she goes on to become an utterly awesome interrogator because for her, missing presumed dead is not good enough mm. but quite often when people look at her career they think well okay she's just sort of landed in soe how does she get there well in actual fact she and her family have a long history of working for british intelligence she obviously in the 1930s but her family go way back before that so she's already you know in those circles and she's not the only sis mi6 female that I have in my book that's worked heavily for MI6 in the 1920s and 30s who end up in SOE. I do focus on three very special so-called secretaries of the 20s and 30s who have expertise in running spy networks and they know the geographical areas of Austria, Eastern Europe, and they go on to be the equivalent of Vera Atkins in section X, which is the Austrian and German section of SOE. So we begin to uncover a new dimension to the SOE history, because quite rightly, we have lots of material coming out and, and understandings of the female agents, as well as the male agents, but we also have women being dropped into Belgium. We have them dropped into Slovenia, all kinds of areas. And now 
we're beginning to look at that. And the single most thread that I discovered was that these women had become experts, much like the women that were rising up through MI5, even though they don't have the title, I even discovered two MI6 chiefs of station who were women in the Second World War. We know precious little about them, but we know now know their names. So it's a, a start. And that's the same with SOE. We've got a really deeper and exciting understanding emerging of SOE that Vera Atkins was not the only SIS woman to appear in SOE. And then on the right there, you have Margot Morse. Her family actually, she passed away about 20 years ago. Her family had obviously dealt with the effects of her estate. She went on to be a founding member, I believe, of the Special Forces Club. And she had an utterly amazing mind for organisational skills. She could completely reorganise and you know, put on a professional footing, SOE's admin side. But the family, sort of 20 years later, decided to open her jewellery box. <laughs> Hence the assassin's pen at the bottom of the screen. You're probably wondering, Paul, what's the yeah. assassin's pen? And they said to me, we found this assassin's pen. Had she ever used it? And now her SOE file has just got three pages in it, just enlistment details. doesn't tell us anything really about what she did. And I said to them, I don't know, it's not possible to tell from her file. But I did cheekily well, say, because they asked me, had she ever used it? <laughs> and my response was, and I was partly serious, well, is there any blood on it? <laughs> so I think they're going away to have a look. But it gives us an idea that so many of these stories have been hidden by official secrecy. Yeah. And it's why so much from the Cold War to contemporary times, we couldn't write a book like this at the moment. The mm. material just isn't there. But and, it, it gives us a glimpse. And, you know, you talked about the official files, but then you, you also have people like Vera Atkins, who's, whose very character was very good at presenting exactly what she wanted to present about herself to people. So even what she said yes. about herself, is only ever true to the to the extent that it's true for that situation. She she's very much to me. I mean, she's if you can have a kind of a favorite figure from from SOE, she's she's in my top kind of two or three because of that background of, of Eastern mm -hmm. European and, and she's a very modern person. She in that she'd be kind of the the jet setting person today that you can't quite put a nationality to. She's she's just a a person of 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 different backgrounds who 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 breezes through different. Mm -hmm. strata never really standing out never really always fitting in but sort of uh, yet yeah, being an individual at the same time if that isn't the paradox and she's very good with her female agents mm. you know there's one touching moment where we see her like that photograph from her file soe file she's got an incredibly strong face yeah but there is a photograph, and I believe it's reprinted in Kate Vigger's book, Mission France. So apologies if I have got it wrong. Either that one or Sarah Helm's book on Vera Atkins. There's a photograph of Vera where she's going to a memorial for her agents later in life. She's a much older woman. And you can see the glint of a tear in her eye. Mm. And she very rarely showed emotion. But she was, in a way, like a maternal figure, although we never think of her like that. But she was fabulous as an agent handler. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's she's in some ways more M in the Bond films than M was. It, 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 all that, that, yeah, maternal parental figure, but also tough as nails, yes. but, but caring about it. You can't, you couldn't progress in this unless you, unless you cared about the people below you. And it, it's a harsh, you know, harsh environment it's a kill or be killed environment and professionalism unprofessionalism will kill will kill yourself and it will kill other mm. people around you as we as we know every time this subject comes up on world war ii dv nearly all resistance networks in europe get broken at some point by the enemy that the very few of them survive without infiltration and and and, and traitors and double cross and things like that so mm. so you, you people it's a it's a yeah kill or be killed so there's no there's no room for sentiment and yet you have to you have to, at the heart of it, care about the people you're sending into the into the the jaws of the jaws of hell, so to speak. 
Yeah, she absolutely understood the situation. And I discovered something else about her. I mean, it says a lot that she becomes a, a truly uncompromising, fearsome interrogator. And she also undergoes, I found some interrogation reports quite accidentally, which she's co-witness to, which had nothing to do with finding her own agents and so the war crimes investigation teams would use her because she was brilliant and she is so far the only woman I have found that went into the London cage in Kensington Palace Gardens to interrogate those die-hard SS and camp commandants in at the end of the war and for anyone who doesn't know the London cage is a interrogation centre that was highly top secret in the war and you could end up there if quote unquote your will to resist could not be broken but it was pretty much those die hard Nazis mm. and she's in there in 45 46 interrogating particular figures tells us a lot about her it was no place for a woman mm. that that centre wow amazing so we, we'll move on to another page of of, of, of legends of anyone who's who knows about this subject? We're, we're talking about some incredible, incredible figures here. So let's yeah. run us through these stories very, very briefly. And of course, folks, there's plenty more in Helen's book um, <laughs> that, that we're covering in this this brief conversation. It's a, it's a, it's a doozy. Yeah, just bringing out some highlights, really. Christina Scarbeck, a.k.a. Christine Granville, that's written so brilliantly by Claire Mully. And if you haven't read her book, The Spy Who Loves, please do. And always more to find out, because I find that she was connected with a lot of the pre-war SIS people that I'd worked on. So that's very, very exciting. But she undertakes the most incredible mission. She's Polish aristocrat originally. Odette Sampson marries Peter Churchill. She survives Ravensbrück, pretty horrible, um, horrendous treatment by the Gestapo, as we know. She was lucky to survive. Virginia Hall, uh, the woman with Cuthbert, Incredible. the wooden leg, we remember her. And I, I remember a wonderful anecdote that I read about Virginia Hall. I mean, she does make it, doesn't she, over the Pyrenees in the dead of winter. She smuggled out, partly with the help of the escape lines. But but her her leg, of course, she has to take painkillers. It's it's no mean feat if you have all your faculties completely working. But she has this disability. And at one point, she messages back to SOE headquarters. And I don't know if you know this story. And she messages back and says, Cuthbert is causing me a lot of pain. Well, that was the name of her leg, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the name of her wooden leg. She named her wooden leg Cuthbert. So she messaged to SOE's headquarters in Baker Street, Cuthbert is causing me a lot of pain. And the response came back from Baker Street in a message, <laughs> annihilate Cuthbert. <laughs> Wow. So, of course, she didn't totally get rid of Cuthbert. I, I interviewed um, Sarah Megan uh, uh, oh, Thomas, did you? who played um, uh, uh, um, Virginia in, plays... in The Call to Spy. And yes. she, because she was having to act with a wooden leg, she had a le she had pain in her leg for like six months after she finished the shoot. And so she said she, you know, she, she had a per kind of a permanent, it's gone now, but she was, she felt Virginia's wooden legs stayed with her for, for six months after film because of that walk she was doing there and while they've, we've got these you know bona fide legend on, on screen there's an interesting question kind of controversial question from peter o'connell there because um he's saying were all the divisions of soe leadership as populated by incompetent upper class twist twits as some reports suggest because we do remember the greats of SOE. We do remember the really brilliant people who did their jobs well. But yes, there were the, the organisation wasn't wasn't without its flaws. So is that what? How would you respond to that? I mean, absolutely true. There's still so much we don't know. And I will say at this point, I'm not an expert on SOE in the mm. same way as so so many other of our historians. So I've looked at particular angles, and I'm recovering. Yeah angles of SOE that haven't been told before. So there is material on F section, there is material on Vera Atkins, but I've been careful not to just sort of repeat those stories that have been, I couldn't do justice to them in the, right. in the space that I had, and it would just not be sensitive to, to their memories either. But yeah, I think there's still an awful lot of questions about particularly SOE in France. And it does make you wonder 
we know that there were 470 agents sent in. Is that the extent? That's that's what we know about. Because for me, I still can't understand why they kept sending the agents in even after they were betrayed. Is it that they still sent in double that number and they all survived and they've, we've never known about them? Mm. It's an open question. It's an unanswerable question. But for me, that was the puzzle. If your networks are going down and they aren't going to survive, I, I, something inside me feels uncomfortable. I don't think the likes of Vera Atkins would send those women in if she knew that every single one of them was really actually going to be killed within a matter of weeks. Something must have been succeeding for them to keep sending them in. And we just don't know that. So, yeah, I mean, for me, we need to look also at the women like Vera Atkins, like my three women, Clara Holmes, Bill, uh, Bill Clara Holmes, uh, she had a male sort of name, uh, Evelyn Stamper and Betty Hodgson. Those three women were the Vera Atkins of Section X. Right. And there were also women doing similar work out of for SOE, out of Istanbul. So, you know, these are really important stories for us to start recovering and i think in so doing that it might help us to understand some of the more difficult areas particularly the disastrous consequences in france that doesn't seem to have been repeated anywhere else other than potentially holland in mm. the engelspiel but we won't go down the engelspiel rabbit hole mm. well we, yeah another one for the day but you're, you're right there's always been a concentration on the French story and not just with historical writing, but with the movies and the, the, the graphic novels and the video games. And of course the, 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 the spider's web of SOE went pretty much across the known world. We've talked about the SOE in, yes. in Burma and things like that in the past, but France seems to be where the public attention is, it, it focuses, but that's a really intriguing comment that you say that maybe there was a whole lot more that we don't know about. Um, Potentially really got me thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's just how my brain works. Something just doesn't quite make sense. And uh, many of the agents that were going to be sent into southern Austria were German Jewish refugees, Austrians, or Austrian anti-Nazis that were not Jewish. And they were primarily dispatched from Italy by my women. Well, they're not mm. literally my women, but the three women you, I you write feel about. You feel some, <laughs> some temporary ownership of them because, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, no, Well, no. Not an ownership, it was perhaps a way of just identifying quickly, but these three women. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. One or two of them working out of uh, Baker Street. They actually ran safe houses, they dispatched the agents. You know, some incredible stories there, including Anton Walter Freud, Sigmund Freud's grandson, was sent behind enemy lines into southern Austria in April 1945 by a woman of SOE mm. that was you know, effectively running Section X, Austrian German section of SOE, the equivalent of Vera Atkins. And I, I haven't looked or probed any further to see, well, there could be more women of other sections of SOE who are the equivalents of Vera Atkins who we haven't discovered yet, mm. or the files just haven't yet been released. Wow. So for me, it's an exciting understanding of SOE that women you know, central. And the reason they were central, why were they given these positions? Why was Vera Atkins where she was? Because she had the expertise. And the citation, particularly for one of the Austrian Austrian experts, uh, secretary, she was British, of course, but working in the Austrian section, was that she was an expert on Austria politically and geographically. She knew the whole of Eastern Europe, like the back of her hand, she knew Czechoslovakia quite well. And her colleague, she was an expert on Italy and the Italian Navy. I mean, extraordinary. And who would know this? Mm. But we're beginning to recover these stories. And for me, it's really not only inspirational, but it gives a depth to history that's incredibly exciting. And the other thing I would want to say, actually, within SIS, MI6, and to a larger extent, too, within the SOE bits that I've looked at, there seems to have been an equality in the treatment of women in terms of allowing these women just like Vera Atkins to just run her her agents and her network. They knew the areas, they knew what to do, and they were trusted, and particularly within SIS, 
in the 20s and 30s, they're on the same level as their chief of station. They're like a big extended family. So again, it gives us an, a, a grayer area. It's not so black and white to say, well, women, mm. you know, they're in a misogynist world. Yes, true up to a point, of course. And they had constraints in civilian life. But if we look at intelligence, it starts to offer a much richer picture now than mm. we'd had before. And, and that's exciting. No, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of comments inside, but I can't put them all up on the screen there. People are talking about why is there more of a focus on France and the other countries? And I'm thinking, is there also more of a focus on the agents whose luck ran out because it's a better, a, a better quote narrative story? If you know the Via Lazabo and the, and actually, if the if the stories, if the agents in different countries are successful, then they're successful because they're not getting caught and because there there are no chase, you know, hue and cry. The Germans aren't or the enemy aren't chasing them. And so maybe we've all been a little bit focused on the on the on the the less successful mission because because of the the thrilling nature of those stories when actually far more universally as you, as you made the point yourself they are still continuing to send lots of agents in there must be lots of people who are just doing their job in an understated way getting back information that that, that is that is helping the war effort but it's sort of going pardon the pun going underground going under the radar well, in terms of the Austrian section, there were around only 25 Austrian Jewish refugees and a few more sort of anti-Nazis. We don't know precisely exact numbers, but it looks like, but what do I know? You know, it might not be. It looks like there were less agents sent in. It was harder to penetrate Austria. So already you've got less biographies to look mm. at, if you like. But when I started out, and I've written widely on the 10,000 Germans that fought for Britain, yeah. uh, doing a revised expanded version of that, by the way. I also wrote a Freud's War and looked at Anton Walter Freud's mission behind enemy lines. And when I wrote those books a decade ago, Section X, its official SOE history, written internally by one of the women, actually, by Evelyn Stamper, had not been declassified. So that might partly be your answer. I'm not sure when the French files were released, but I interviewed a number of veterans, including the late Eric Sanders, who passed away last year at the age of 101. He was dispatched into Italy and was waiting for his mission by the women, by these three women, but he didn't go into mission because one of his colleagues didn't come back. And for the life of me, I've remembered the colleague's name so many times but i've temporarily forgotten it but just before he died before eric died the files were released and i was able to say to him this is what happened to your colleague he was captured by the ss on the border and killed and that's why he never went into mission in, into his mission because the previous guy didn't come back so the stories are there i think it's just a matter of us working through them but France right. was particularly disastrous, as was Holland, and Holland until 1944. Brilliant. Well, that, that's a nice answer to, the, to, the, to, the, to that subject. We'll do a couple more slides, then we'll kind of open up to a few more questions because they're flying in now. So um, you know, it's all very well, the, you know, the field agents and people oper operating out there in countries, but there's all these, you know, your book is way more than that. There's the, the massive great, we talked about at the beginning there, the, network of what's going on so tell us a little bit about what's what the other aspect of your book the, the non-field work in intelligence mm. so we've also got of course the the stations like bletchley park and i do look at and try and recover the stories of some of the senior female co-breakers that aren't really known about and then we might just have an obituary that's sort of a decade old and no one really knows their stories anymore so i've started to recover those and I think that's all I'll say on Bletchley Park for now because it's an, an area that people kind of pretty much know about. But I'll leave them to read what I have uncovered on some of the news stories. And with the help of the Bletchley Park Trust, they've been amazing because they've obviously got more of an archive now and they've been, they have their interviews with veterans and their former trustee, Michael Smith, fabulous historian mm -hmm. love his stuff he's also been incredibly helpful on the bletchley park material for me so that's great and perhaps i'll leave our audience to read the bletchley park chapter because I, I wonder if we could move on to to the other branches of military intelligence that doesn't get so much recognition and i have 
talked about before. This is Latimer House yeah. in Buckinghamshire. There was Wilton Park and Trent Park. This is where they're eavesdropping on German prisoners of war and getting intelligence from them after a sort of loose interrogation, a friendly chat. And this woman we can see on the screen is Catherine Townshend. And she, in fact, at the age of 21, becomes in charge of the whole of the M room technology, M room where the secret listeners are, the male secret listeners in their special rooms with the special equipment all wired to the cells or in the case of Trent Park to the stately rooms. And in 1942, she's working out of Wilton Park. This is the headquarters of, of part of this operation. And that's there she's pictured at her desk. And in 1942, Major Back, who she's been working with, is posted away and she comes in that morning and he says, well, you're the only one who knows the job because she's liaised with secret departments. Even the women and the men working around her in the offices don't know what she's doing. She's just sat at her desk. But she actually is in charge from 1942 until just beyond the end of the war for kitting out all the emblems, whether it's in Cairo, as our troops go up through Italy, into Germany eventually, she and two women who work with her, she recruits them. The whole team, the whole tech team was run by women. I mean, unbelievable, and it's just hidden until mm. now. So uh, that I'm to gonna, me is exciting. I'm gonna make a really terrible male comment now, but <laughs> is it a multitasking quality that they have? Because you know, you've got to keep lots of plates juggling. If you're working with multiple countries and gadgets and things, is that some kind of skill? These or is, am I am I really being offensive by suggesting that that that, that that's a that's a particularly feminine trope? Is or am I onto something? Maybe slightly. Well, possibly. Traditionally, people do think not only in this field, isn't it? But perhaps in the household, women can do all kinds of things all at once. <laughs> See to screaming kids whilst cooking the tea, yeah. whilst yeah, yeah, yeah. answering the front door to the postman or postwoman. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't want to comment on particular traits of of men and women, but that's fine. We have skills, e each of us. And I think whatever our, our gender, our culture, our background, to use the skills that are needed. And that's something I did discover, that the intelligence services were using the, the skills that they needed at the time. So they had female interrogators at Latimer House. I haven't shown you those women, but they were also the interrogators, the first known interrogators in uniform in the Second World War from 1941, mm -hmm. worked out of naval intelligence at this site. And, and that's a chance discovery for an interview with a veteran. And the other thing I discovered, I want to, you know, big shout out for naval intelligence, because that quite often gets missed in this wholesome look at either intelligence or the Second World War, I discovered that one of the women, because you love things D-Day, so I found you a D-Day oh, anecdote. Oh, cool, wonderful. Sits up, pay attention. <laughs> woman in the Admiral team, one of the sections, um, section S8, I think, or eight, sorry, section S8, I'll start again, section 8S, I need right. a gin and tonic, don't I? Um, <laughs> She was actually head of the section that was in charge, and she was solely in charge of all of the intelligence picture for the Normandy landings for the Admiralty. And I read it and I thought, have I misread this? <laughs> and I read it several times and I even copied it because I thought no one will believe me. And I thought that's incredible. Just a couple of lines that tell us in a, a section history some of them in the Apple Tea, you can read about them, they were known as the secret ladies. I'm not going to tell you what they were, but you <laughs> can read about those when you get around to reading the book. But these are the kinds of things we're beginning to recover. But there'll be equally exciting stories about the men that, mm. again, obscured by official secrecy. Mm. But the, for me, the timing now is to bring out these stories of the women yeah. because it is significant. And it, and it but seemed... that's not to disconnect them from from their colleagues, their no, male exactly. colleagues. It seems to me, as you said yourself, it's an environment, environment where skills, you rise to the top. It's not about your age, your gender, your your height. or no. the, you know, In certain aspects of World War II, commandos, you've got to be fit. If you can't climb over mountains, you can't be a commando. But in this, you could kind of be a, a 60 something world intelligence operator or a 20. It's all about brain power. It's all about the the, the, the skill sets you bring. And, and, and it, it was in that way, without 
necessarily trying to be progressive. It was being very progressive by, as you said yourself, that the, it's all about can you do the job? And if you can do the job, you rise very quickly because there's clearly a huge amount of work to be done. It's This is a, a an industry that is is affecting the outcome of the war and for, for in a sem in some ways low cost you know three or four people in an office can can be working on something that can potentially save thousands of lives or, or speed up the war effort so it's a brain power being used and harnessed i think is the key isn't it yeah so rf medmanum uh the, the, they have the model section and female artists as well as male artists were making these models you probably know all about those of course yeah. ahead of all the commando landings torch Operation Torch, D-Day, etc. And Eisenhower said, these model makers, each one of these model makers is worth 100 men because of the lives they would have saved, actually, mm. through these intricate, intricate models. That's what he said. Um, so, yeah, it gives oh. us an understanding of the significance. And I like the fact that today we've shifted from, say, a decade ago, that we're looking not just at the the very brave, all the kind of gung-ho stuff, of course, on the front line. But now there is an appreciation of the interconnectedness of the war, of the home front. What's the land army doing? What are, what are the Spitfire, you know, women doing? What are, you know, what are, are other men doing on the home front to support the war effort? And I think that that shift is really welcome, but it wasn't there a decade ago. So no, you're right. It, it is way. moving that way. People are starting it's to good. understand the tail behind you know the the the, re, the, the, yes. the point of the spear is one aspect and it's very exciting and sexy and people running out of landing craft and fight and, and, and piloting fighter aircraft but behind that is all that incredible resource we've talked about you know the next photo there the aerial yes. intelligence i mean again as a, as a normandy guy you know when i was out today with an author who's writing a book about deed and i'm talking about just the incredible picture allied soldiers have of normandy from all these sources it's it's resistance it's soe it's aerial mm -hmm. photos it's it's just dissecting and collating and gathering and putting this information together and then reducing it down to what the matter what matters so that because that, that's something is sifting isn't it that it's the it's all very well then you're know, going back to those first world war uh, operatives you're know, listening to stuff and, you know, and and knitting codes it's it's then sifting the information you sent for what actually matters and 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 trying to because it's speed. Speed counts. If there's a, a unit moving somewhere, it's no good that information being uh, uh, taken a week later. It needs to be done right mm. now. So that's that speed of putting information together. Yes. So, so again, run us through a few stories while we've got a few minutes left. Yeah, so we have here, well, at the top there, Constance Babington Smith, a very famous legend. photograph of Another her. legend. <laughs> She's a legend. I'm still wanting to do a bit more on her work with the V weapons because... Uh, as we know from the listening sites, that was the corroborative evidence when the German generals at Trent Parks mentioned Pinimunda, the RAF flew over again and the results of about four missions, the results were sent to RAF Medmanum. And I'm still trying to track, before Pinimunda was bombed in the middle of August 1943, I'm trying to find the concrete evidence, whether it really is true that Constant Babington Smith actually identified those sites before August 1943. We certainly know that she did some groundbreaking analysis in by November 43, which actually found some of the mobile sites that were were actually beginning to be developed. So again, I'm I'm sort of devil for the detail really, because it's very easy for historians to have broad sweep that she did this, she did that, but actually we have to be sure that that's actually the case. So I might do a little bit more research on that. Can we show one more slide as well? We can, because yeah. Think, yeah, this, <laughs> oh, look at this. We've got developed invisible ink on the right-hand side from one of the double agents. And we think of the male double agents, we've got any number of them agent zigzag we've got garbo we all know about the deceptions ahead of d-day but did we know that there were a whole raft of women i try and name all of them even if it's just a small paragraph about what we can know about them some of their files have not been declassified some of them have and they're incredibly exciting this is ecclesiastic on the left she's photographing material her abfair handler thinks she's working really for the Germans, but actually, of course, she's working for us. She was an SIS uh, double agent. The double cross system 
actually was run had representatives from MI5 and MI6 and Bronx was the code name of Elvia Chardois she actually provided deception not dissimilar to to Garbo but in a different area mm. ahead of D-Day you can read about that but you can see there I've probably got the photo I've put the photograph the wrong way around I do apologize on the powerpoint but so uh vertically you can see her original message you know, it's a nice sunny day. It's yep. heavily bombed in London. Whatever she's saying to her fictitious uh, correspondent in Lisbon, which then goes to her handler. But now horizontally, you can see the original secret message that was originally in Invisible Ink. So this is quite rare. They don't don't survive these letters in all of their files. So for me, that was exciting to stumble across a real letter where the invisible ink could actually be seen and it, having I mean, it developed. And it must be. I mean, I know you're, you're, you you just said how disciplined you are in, in determining dates, things like that. But then you're also going to write about gadgets and invisible ink and assassin. <laughs> but I mean, it, you must get those moments where you feel like you're kind of living in a, a James Bond world. It is. In a way, it's it, nothing's really invented. Ian Fleming was in and out of these worlds. He was in and out of those eavesdropping sites. He's working with the gadget teams. He hasn't invented any of this stuff, really. I mean, it's gone way beyond what, what MI9, um, that branch of military intelligence responsible for this, did. But I think that's what's the exciting thing. You don't really know what you're going to find in the files. And when you do, sometimes it's so much more fascinating. It's certainly stranger than fiction. You think, oh my goodness, that's really true. They really did this, and mm. they managed to pull off things. I mean, look at Operation Mincemeat, at which women were yeah. involved. Who thought? And I worked through those files. Who thought that the this could be pulled off? That the Germans would swallow it, and they did. Mm. And it was like this complete fictitious story that actually, in reality, paid off. And I think that's what we like. Perhaps it's that fine line between fact and fiction and we're never totally sure when we read things sometimes but yeah now i think it is an exciting period for us as historians because there are so many new stories that we can begin to tell yeah no, and my kind of last question to go before i bring things in because you're you're very busy is um measuring the success of of anything the concept i mean with with aerial photos it's a little bit easier because you can see that it does mm -hmm. you know, and the map the model making you reference but with the the more um, underground, discreet spy. How do you measure the success of that? Because it's very, it's very difficult. You can see when a division on a, on the ground moves and takes yes. a town. There we are. We've taken the town. We weren't in the town, and now we are in the town. But but looking at the results of intelligence, because I, I I never kind of buy those books that say having agents in the ground sped up the the war by six months so it, it, it you know when eisenhower wrote that letter saying the resistance in french was worth 15 divisions or something i, I don't know I, i'm not always like how do you what where do you get that from so how, how do you how would you rate if you had to how how you can you can get some kind of extrapolation about what intelligence achieved for us in world war ii well, I did that in my book, The Walls Have Ears, because I yeah. knew there's always vast amount of intelligence. What What's the impact? Is, can we trace something? And as you know, I traced that with the V weapons, and it's yeah. now really clear. So I'm doing a bit more work on that for my next book that I can't talk about yet. Okay. But that I'm going to have to trace the impact of certain pieces of intelligence and what difference did it make quote unquote on the ground so it isn't easy and it isn't easy to see where small snippets of information might have had any impact at all but some of these networks particularly the alliance aka noah's ark in france you know again it was one of the most important intelligence networks mm. for the information they brought but actually linking what did they discover and how did that affect the war in very simplistic terms is your question mm. is actually quite a difficult trace to make but i am ambitious and i'm going to have a go mm. in my next book and if anyone could do it you can and it, it doesn't it, the the difference it made can be small but that doesn't but battles and wars are won by small margins you know very rarely in history does one side, abs side absolutely dominate and and thrash another side in a very quick decisive battle or campaign it's a long drawn out chess yeah. game of small movements that gradually 
turn the the the, the, the war in favor of one side. So, you know, I, I don't like the YouTube channels that had the thing that changed the outcome of the war, the turn turning points. There's, yes. there's thousands of turning points, and all of them are not necessarily dr a dramatic 180. They're a little minute change on the compass that, that begins to steer the war a different way. And you add them all together, and you can see that there's this cumulative effect. But very rarely does a single thing have the well that 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 say that shaved two years off the war. That that that's that's sort of nonsense. That's hard to say. We could say that without certain discoveries at certain points in the war, it could have dramatically affected the outcome of the war. Yeah. That's true from the analysis I wasn't expecting to find in The Walls Have Ears. So occasionally it is possible to, to look at the bigger pieces of intelligence and see the impact. But you're right, those smaller things. What did the discovery of this new piece of German equipment in 1943 mean for the Battle of the Atlantic, for example? Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know, we're discovering all kinds of things, new equipment, even before it's operational by the Germans. Did that have any impact? And those small ripples are really hard to make a line. It's, it's, and I, I, like you, I'm uncomfortable with people saying, well, this knocked six months off the war. I think it's hard to say that or two years or whatever. It certainly shortened the war. Intelligence shortened the war. It meant that the so-called boots on the ground weren't fighting blind. Mm. They had the best chance possible. And, you know, we don't know how it shortened the war, but it did shorten the war and it did save lives. So I think no. that's as far as we can say. I think we can't start shaving four years off the war or two months off the war. I'm not quite sure how you quantify that. But And it also shows the willingness for the Allies to invest in uh, the new the new way of defeating the enemy. You know, we, we didn't just send in scores of infantry and just run them across fields. It was like, no, we, we can win this in our heads and give the, mm. the troops an advantage before we actually go into in, into the into combat. So the, the improvement of, of, of technology and look at aviation technology, you know, biplanes yes. in, in, in the 30s, the jets in 1945. And, and intelligence was going through the same revolution or at least evolution, if not revolution, that that, that, that set, you know, that, that sets us up the, the world for the for the next chapter, which is you know the Cold War, alas. And um, but yeah, we will bring things to end because they're incredibly busy. Um we could come, we could bring you back and just do a question and answer session. People are asking about SOE in, in the Netherlands, they're asking about walls have ears, but you've got things to do. But Helen, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. I wish we'd spent longer if we have waves, but you we end up trying to catch with all, all our friends. But it's folks, I'll hold it up again there. It's 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 an absolute must-have, as are all of Helen's books. I've got you've got your own little section of shelf uh, in my, in in the World War II TV household with your exceptional cover art design. So so thank you very much for joining us. And thank I look you. forward to finding a reason to bring you back with this elusive, secretive book that you're writing right now. Thank you. Brilliant. So thanks, everybody, folks. I will see you again next week for Philippines Week. We've got to watch the times of the of the, of the show's channel, uh, folks, because there's different times of the day because of the time difference. But Helen, thank you for joining us. Viewers, thank you for joining us. I will see you all next, week, next week. Cheers, everybody. Bye.